This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle A Scandal in Bohemia To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes, she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen but as a lover he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passions, save with a jibe and a sneer. They were admirable things for the observer, excellent for drawing the veil from men's motives and actions, but for the trained reasoner to admit such intrusions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw a doubt upon all his mental results. Grit in a sensitive instrument, or a crack in one of his own high-power lenses would not be more disturbing than a strong emotion in a nature such as his, and yet there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler, of dubious and questionable memory. I had seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness, and the home centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment, was sufficient to absorb all my attention. While Holmes, who loathed every form of society with his whole bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street, buried among his old books, alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition, the drowsiness of the drug and the fierce energy of his own keen nature, he was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime, and occupied his immense faculties and extraordinary powers of observation in following out those clues and clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. From time to time I heard some vague account of his doings, his summons to Odessa in the case of the trip-off murder, of his clearing up of the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers, and finally of the mission which he had accomplished so delicately and successfully for the reigning family of Holland. Beyond these signs of his activity, however, which I merely shared with all the readers of the daily press, I knew little of my former friend and companion. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I now returned to civil practice, which my way led me through Baker Street, as I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my wooing, and with the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit, and, even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room, swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work, again. He had risen out of his drug-created dreams and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber which had formerly been in part my own. His manner was not effusive, it seldom was, but he was glad, I think, to see me. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved me to an armchair, threw across his case of cigars and indicated a spirit case and a gasogene in the corner. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in his singular, introspective fashion. Wedlock suits you, he remarked. I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven, I answered. Indeed. I should have thought a little more, just a trifle more, I fancy, Watson, and in practice again I observe you did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you've been getting yourself very wet lately? 
and that you have the most clumsy and careless servant girl. My dear Holmes, said I, this is too much. You would certainly have been burned had you lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had a country walk on Thursday and came home in a dreadful mess, but as I have changed my clothes, I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice, but there again I fail to see how you work it out. He chuckled to himself and rubbed his long, nervous hands together. It is simplicity itself, said he. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is scored by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they have been caused by someone who has very carelessly scraped around the edges of the sole in order to remove crusted mud from it. Hence, you see, my double deduction that you had been out in vile weather, and that you had a particularly malignant boot-slitting specimen of the London slavely. As to your precise, if a gentleman walks into my room smelling of iodoform, with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger, and a bulge on the right side of his top hat, I must be dull indeed if I do not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. I could not help laughing at the ease with which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself, though at each successive instance of your reasoning I'm baffled until you explain the process. And yet, I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so, he answered, lighting a cigarette and throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently? How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so, you have not observed, and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now I know that there are seventeen steps, because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, and since you are good enough to chronicle one or two of my trifling experiences, you may be interested in this. He threw over a sheet of thick, pink-tinted newspaper which had been lying open upon the table. It came by the last post, said he. Read it aloud. The note was undated and without either signature or address. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock, it said. A gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may be safely trusted with matters of which are in importance, which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Be in your chamber then at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wear a mask. This is indeed a mystery, I remarked. What do you imagine that it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. But the note itself, what do you deduce from it? I carefully examined the writing and the paper upon which it was written. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do, I remarked, endeavouring to imitate my companion's processes. Such a paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. It is peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar? That is the very word, said Holmes. It is not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. I did so and I saw a large E with a small G, a P, and a large G with a small T woven into the texture of the paper. What do you make of that? asked Holmes. The name of the maker, no doubt, or his monogram, rather? Not at all. The G with the small T stands for Gesselschaft, which is German for company. It is a customary contraction like R, Co. P, of course, stands for Papier. Now, the E.G., let us glance at our continental gazetteer. He took down a heavy brown volume from his shelves. Iglo, Iglonitz, here we are. Egria. It is in a German-speaking country. In Bohemia. Not far from Carlsbad. Remarkable as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein, and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. My boy, what do you make of that? His eyes sparkled, and he sent up a great blue triumphant cloud from his cigarette. The paper was made in Bohemia, I said. Precisely. And the man who wrote the note is a German. Do you note the peculiar construction of the sentence, this account of you we have from all quarters received? A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. 
It is the German who is so uncourteous to his verbs. It only remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German, who writes upon bohemian paper, and prefers wearing a mask to showing his face. And here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve all of our doubts. As he spoke, there was a sharp sound of horses' hoofs and grating wheels against the curb, followed by a sharp pull at the bell. Holmes whistled. A pair, by the sound, said he. Yes, he continued, glancing out of the window. A nice little brougham and a pair of beauties, a hundred and fifty guineas apiece. There's money in this case, Watson, if there's nothing else. I think that I had better go, Holmes. Not a bit, doctor. Stay where you are. I'm lost without my Boswell, and this promises to be interesting. It would be a pity to miss it. But your client? Never mind him. I may want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in that armchair, doctor, and give us your best attention. A slow and heavy step which had been heard upon the stairs and in the passage paused immediately outside the door. Then a loud and authoritative tap. Come in, said Holmes. A man entered who could hardly have been less than six feet six inches in height, with the chest and limbs of a Hercules. His dress was rich with a richness which would in England be looked upon as akin to bad taste. Heavy bands of astrakhan were slashed across the sleeves and fronts of his double-breasted coat, while the deep blue cloak which was thrown over his shoulders was lined with flame-coloured silk, and secured at the neck with a brooch which consisted of a single flaming barrel. Boots which extended halfway up his calves and which were trimmed at the tops with rich brown fur completed the impression of barbaric opulence, which was suggested by his whole appearance. He carried a broad-brimmed hat in his hand while he wore across the upper part of his face, extending down past the cheekbones, a black vizard mask, which he had apparently been adjusting at that very moment, for his hand was still raised to it as he entered. From the lower part of the face he appeared to be a man of strong character, with a thick hanging lip and a long straight chin, suggestive of resolution pushed to the length of obstinacy. "'You had my note?' he asked with a deep, harsh voice and a strongly marked German accent. "'I told you that I would call.' He looked from one to the other of us, as if uncertain which to address. "'Pray take a seat,' said Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases. Whom have I the honour to address? You may address me as Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honour and discretion, whom I may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance. If not, I should much prefer to communicate with you alone. I rose to go, but Holmes caught me by the wrist and pushed me back into the chair. It is both or none, said he. You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me. The Count shrugged his broad shoulders. Then I must begin, said he, by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. At present, it is not too much to say that it is of such weight it may have an influence upon European history. I promise, said Holmes, and I. You will excuse this mask, continued our strange visitor. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you, and I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I was aware of it, said Holmes dryly. The circumstances are of great delicacy, and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow to be an immense scandal and seriously compromise one of the reigning families of Europe. To speak plainly, the matter implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was also aware of that, murmured Holmes, settling himself down in his armchair and closing his eyes. Our visitor glanced with some apparent surprise at the languid, lounging figure of the man who had been no doubt depicted to him as the most incisive reasoner and most energetic agent in Europe. Holmes slowly reopened his eyes and looked impatiently at his gigantic client. If your majesty would condescend to state your case, he remarked, I should be better able to advise you. The man sprang from his chair and paced up and down the room in uncontrollable agitation. 
Then, with a gesture of desperation, he tore the mask from his face and hurled it upon the ground. You are right, he cried. I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed, murmured Holmes. Your majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gottsreich, Sigismund von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Kasselfelstein and hereditary King of Bohemia. But you can understand, said our strange visitor, sitting down once more and passing his hand over his high white forehead, you can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter was so delicate that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have come incognito from Prague for the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult, said Holmes, shutting his eyes once more. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, during a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Kindly look her up in my index, doctor, murmured Holmes without opening his eyes. For many years he had adopted a system of docketing all paragraphs concerning men and things, so that it was difficult to name a subject or a person on which he could not at once furnish information. In this case, I found her biography, sandwiched in between that of a Hebrew rabbi and that of a staff commander who had written a monograph upon the deep-sea fishes. Let me see, said Holmes, born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Contralto, La Scala, Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Yes, retired from the operatic stage, living in London, quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so. But how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? None. And I fail to follow your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the writing. A forgery. My private note paper? Stolen. My own seal? Imitated. My photograph? Bought. We were both in the photograph. Oh dear. That is very bad, your majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. I was mad. Insane. You have compromised yourself seriously. I was only crown prince then. I was young, but I am thirty now. It must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she travelled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it. Absolutely none. Holmes laughed. It is quite a pretty little problem, said he. But a very serious one to me, returned the king reproachfully. Very, indeed. And what does she propose to do with the photograph? To ruin me. But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. To Clotilde Lothman, the second daughter of the king of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler threatens to send them the photograph. And she will do it. I know that she will do it. You do not know her. She has a soul of steel. She has the face of the most beautiful woman and the mind of the most resolute of men. Rather than I should marry another woman, rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. None. You are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed, and that will be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet, said Holmes with a yawn. That is very fortunate, as I have one or two matters of importance to look into just at present. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at the Langham under the name of Count von Cram. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then, as to money, you have carte blanche. Absolutely. I tell you that I would give one of my provinces of my kingdom to have that photograph. And for present expenses? The king took a heavy chamois leather bag from under his cloak, 
and laid it on the table. There are three hundred pounds in gold and seven hundred in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook and handed it to him. And Mademoiselle's address, he asked. Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Holmes took a note of it. One other question, said he. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then good night, your majesty. And I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added, as the wheels of the royal brougham rolled down the street. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. At three o'clock precisely, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. I sat down beside the fire, however, with the intention of awaiting him, however long he might be. I was already deeply interested in his inquiry, but though it was surrounded by none of the grim and strange features which were associated with the two crimes I had already recorded, the nature of the case and the exalted station of his client gave it a character of its own. Indeed, apart from the nature of the investigation which my friend had on hand, there was something in his masterly grasp of a situation and his keen incisive reasoning which made it a pleasure to me to study his system of work and to follow the quick subtle methods by which he disentangled the most inextricable mysteries. So accustomed was I to his invariable success that the very possibility of his failing had ceased to enter into my head. It was close upon four before the door opened and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kempt and side-whiskered with an inflamed face and disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain it was indeed he. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, tweed-suited and respectable as of old. Putting his hands into his pockets, he stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughed heartily for some minutes. Well, really, he cried, and then he choked and laughed again until he was obliged to lie back limp and helpless in his chair. What is it? It's quite too funny. I'm sure you could never guess how I employed my morning, or what I ended up doing. I can't imagine. I suppose that you've been watching the habits and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler? Quite so. But the sequel was rather unusual. I will tell you, however, I left the house a little after eight o'clock this morning, in the character of a groom out of work. There is a wonderful sympathy and freemasonry among horsey men. Be one of them and you will know all that there is to know. I soon found Bryony Lodge. It is a bijou villa with a garden at the back, but built out in front right up to the road. Two stories. Chub lock to the door. Large sitting room on the right side. Well furnished, with long windows almost to the floor, and those preposterous English window fasteners which a child could open. Behind, there was nothing remarkable save a passage window that could be reached from the top of the coach house. I walked round it and examined it closely from every point of view, but without noting anything else of interest. I then lounged down the street and found, as I expected, that there was a mews in a lane which runs down by one wall of the garden. I lent in the ostlers a hand in rubbing down their horses and received in exchange two pence, a glass of half and half, two fills of shag tobacco, and as much information as I could desire about Miss Adler, to say nothing of half a dozen other people in the neighbourhood in whom I was not in the least interested, but whose biographies I was compelled to listen to. And what of Irene Adler, I asked? Oh, she has turned all the men's heads down in that part. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet, so say the serpentine muse to a man. She lives quietly, sings at concerts, drives out at five every day and returns at seven sharp for dinner, seldom goes out at other times except when she sings. Has only one male visitor, but a good deal of him, dark, handsome and dashing, never calls less than once a day and often twice. He is a Mr. Godfrey Norton of the Inner Temple, see the advantages of a cabman as a confidant. They had driven him home a dozen times from Serpentine Mews and knew all about him. When I had listened to all they had to tell, I began to walk up and down near Briony Lodge once more, 
to think over my plan of campaign. This Godfrey Norton was evidently an important factor in the matter. A lawyer, that sounded ominous. What was the relation between them? What was the object of his repeated visits? Was she his client, his friend, his mistress? If the former, she had probably transferred the photograph to his keeping. If the latter, it was less likely. On the issue of this question depended whether I should continue my work at Briony Lodge or turn my attention to the gentleman's chambers in the temple. It was a delicate point, and it widened the field of my inquiry. I fear that I bore you with these details, but I have to let you see my little difficulties if you are to understand the situation. I'm following you closely, I answered. I was still balancing the matter in my mind when a handsome cab drove up to Briony Lodge, and a gentleman sprang out. He was a remarkably handsome man, dark, aquiline, and moustached. Evidently the man of whom I had heard. He appeared to be in a great hurry shouted to the cabman to wait and brushed past the maid who opened the door with an air of a man who was thoroughly at home. He was in the house about half an hour and I could catch glimpses of him in the windows of the sitting room, pacing up and down, talking excitedly and waving his arms. Of her I could see nothing. Presently he emerged, looking even more flurried than before. As he stepped up to the cab, he pulled a gold watch from his pocket and looked at it earnestly. Drive like the devil, he shouted, first to Gross and Hankies in Regent Street and then the Church of St. Monica in Edgware Road. Half a guinea if you do it in twenty minutes. Away they went, and I was just wondering whether I should not do well to follow them when up the lane and came a neat little Lando, the coachman with his coat only half-buttoned and his tie under his ear, while all the tags of his harness were sticking out of the buckles. It hadn't pulled up before she shot out the hall door and into it, I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman, with a face that a man might die for. "'The Church of St. Monica, John,' she cried, "'and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes.' This was quite too good to lose, Watson. I was just balancing whether I should run for it or whether I should perch behind her lander when a cab came through the street. The driver looked twice at such a shabby face, but I jumped in before he could object. "'The Church of St. Monica,' said I and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. It was twenty-five minutes to twelve, and of course it was clear enough what was in the wind. My cabby drove fast. I don't think I ever drove faster, but the others were there before us. The cab and the landau with their steaming horses were in front of the door when I arrived. I paid the man and hurried into the church. There was not a soul there, save the two whom I had followed and a surpliced clergyman, who seemed to be expostulating with them. They were all three standing in a knot in front of the altar. I lounged up the side aisle like any other idler who had dropped into the church. Suddenly, to my surprise, the three at the altar faced round to me, and Godfrey Norton came running as hard as he could towards me. "'Thank God,' he cried. "'You'll do. Come, come.' "'What then?' I asked. "'Come, man, only three minutes, or it won't be legal.' I was half-dragged up to the altar, and before I knew where I was, I found myself mumbling responses which were whispered in my ear— and vouching for things of which I knew nothing, and generally assisting in the secure tying-up of Irene Adler's spinster to Godfrey Norton, bachelor. It was all done in an instant, and there was the gentleman thanking me on the one side and the lady on the other, while the clergyman beamed on me in front. It was the most preposterous position in which I have ever found myself in my life, and it was the thought of it that started me laughing just now. It seems that there had been some informality about their license, that the clergyman absolutely refused to marry them without a witness of some sort, and that my lucky appearance saved the bridegroom from having to sally out into the streets in search of a best man. The bride gave me a sovereign, and I mean to wear it on my watch chain, in memory of the occasion. That is a very unexpected turn of affairs, said I. And what then? Well, I found my plans very seriously menaced. It looked as if the pair might make an immediate departure, and so to necessitate very prompt and energetic measures on my part. At the church door, however, they separated, he driving back to the temple and she to her own house. I shall drive out in the park at five as usual, she said as she left him. I heard no more. They drove away in different directions, and I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Some cold beef and a glass of beer, he answered, ringing the bell. I've been too busy to think of food, and I am likely to be busier still this evening. By the way, doctor, I shall want your cooperation. I shall be delighted. You don't mind breaking the law? Not in the least. Nor running a chance of arrest. 
not in a good cause. Oh, the cause is excellent. Then I am your man. I was sure that I might rely on you. But what is it you wish? When Mrs. Turner has brought in the tray, I will make it clear to you now, he said as he turned hungrily on the simple fare that our landlady had provided. I must discuss it while I eat, for I have not much time. It's nearly five now. In two hours we must be on the scene of action. Miss Irene, or Madam, rather, returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already arranged what is to occur. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I am to be neutral, to do nothing, whatever. There will probably be some small unpleasantness. Do not join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting-room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window. Yes, you are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes, and when I raise my hand, so, you will throw into the room what I give you to throw, and will at the same time raise the cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. It is nothing very formidable he said, taking a long cigar-shaped roll from his pocket. It is an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at either end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to that. When you raise your cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I will rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I have made myself clear. I am to remain neutral, to get near the window, to watch you, and at the signal to throw in this object and raise the cry of fire, and to wait you at the corner of the street. Precisely. Then you may entirely rely on me. That is excellent, I think. Perhaps it is almost time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. He disappeared into his bedroom, and returned in a few minutes in the character of an amiable and simple-minded nonconformist clergyman. His broad black hat, his baggy trousers, his white tie, his sympathetic smile and general look of peering and benevolent curiosity was such as Mr. John Hare alone could have equaled. It was not merely that Holmes changed his costume. His expression, his manner, his very soul seemed to vary with every fresh part that he assumed. The stage lost a fine actor, even as science lost an acute reasoner when he became a specialist in crime. It was a quarter past six when we left Baker Street and it still waited ten minutes to the hour when we found ourselves in Serpentine Avenue. It was already dusk, and the lamps were just being lighted. As we paced up and down in front of Briony Lodge, waiting for the coming of its occupant, the house was just as I had pictured it from Sherlock Holmes's succinct description, but the locality appeared to be less private than I expected. On the contrary, for a small street in a quiet neighborhood, it was remarkably animated. There was a group of shabbily dressed men smoking and laughing in a corner, a scissor grinder with his wheel, two guardsmen flirting with a nurse girl, and several well-dressed young men lounging up and down with cigars in their mouths. You see, remarked Holmes as we paced to and fro in front of the house, this marriage rather simplifies matters. The photograph becomes a double-edged weapon now. The chances are that she would have been adverse to its being seen by Mr. Godfrey Norton. As our client is to, it's coming to the eyes of the princess. Now, the question is, where are we to find the photograph? Where indeed? It is most likely that she carries it about with her. It is cabinet size, too large for easy concealment about a woman's dress. She knows that the king is capable of having her waylaid and searched. Two attempts of the sort have been made. We may take it, then, that she does not carry it about with her. Where, then? Her banker or her lawyer? There is that double possibility. But I am inclined to think neither. Women are naturally secretive, and they like to do their own secreting. Why should she hand it over to anyone else? She could trust her own guardianship, but she could not tell what indirect or political influence might be brought to bear upon a businessman. Besides, remember she had resolved to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands upon it. It must be in her own house. But it has twice been burgled. They did not know how to look. But how will you look? I will not look. What then? I will get her to show me. But she will refuse. She will not be able to. 
but I hear the rumble of wheels. It is her carriage now. Carry out my orders to the letter. As he spoke, the gleam of the side lights of a carriage came round the curve of the avenue. It was a smart little lando which rattled up to the door of Briony Lodge. As it pulled up, one of the loafing men at the corner dashed forward to open the door in the hope of earning a copper, but was elbowed away by another loafer who had rushed up with the same intention. A fierce quarrel broke out, which was increased by the two guardsmen who took sides with one of the loungers and by the scissor grinder, who was equally hot upon the other side. A blow was struck, and in an instant the lady who had stepped from the carriage was the centre of a little knot of flushed and struggling men, who struck savagely at each other with their fists and sticks. Holmes dashed into the crowd to protect the lady, but just as he reached her he gave a cry and dropped to the ground, with the blood running freely down his face. At his fall the guardsmen took to their heels in one direction, and the loungers in the other, while a number of better-dressed people who had watched the scuffle without taking part in it crowded in to help the lady and to attend to the injured man. Irene Adler, as I will still call her, had hurried up the steps, but she stood at the top with her superb figure outlined against the lights of the hall, looking back into the street. "'Is the poor gentleman hurt much?' she asked." "'He is dead,' cried several voices. "'No, no, there's life in him,' shouted another. "'But he'll be gone before you can get him to hospital.' "'He's a brave fellow,' said a woman. "'They would have had the lady's purse and watch if it hadn't been for him. "'They were a gang, and a rough one, too. <gasps> "'He's breathing now. "'He can't lie in the street. "'May we bring him in, ma'am? "'Surely. "'Bring him into the sitting room. "'There's a comfortable sofa this way, please.' Slowly and solemnly he was borne into Briony Lodge and laid out in the principal room, while I still observed proceedings from my post by the window. The lamps had been lit, but the blinds had not been drawn, so that I could see Holmes as he lay upon the couch. I do not know whether he was seized with compunction at the moment for the part he was playing, but I know that I never felt more heartily ashamed of myself in my life than when I saw the beautiful creature against whom I was conspiring the grace and kindliness with which she had waited upon the injured man. And yet, it would be the blackest treachery to Holmes to draw back now from the part which he had entrusted to me. I hardened my heart and took the smoke rocket from my ulster. After all, I thought, we're not injuring her. We are but preventing her from injuring another. Holmes had sat upon the couch and I saw him motion like a man in need of air. A maid rushed across the room and threw open the window. At the same instant I saw him raise his hand, and at the signal I tossed my rocket into the room with a cry of, Fire! The word was no sooner out of my mouth than the whole crowd of spectators, well-dressed and ill, gentlemen, ostlers, and servant-maids, joined in a general shriek of, Fire! Thick clouds of smoke curled through the room, and out at the open window... I caught a glimpse of rushing figures, and a moment later the voice of Holmes from within assuring them that it was a false alarm, slipping through the shouting crowd. I made my way to the corner of the street, and in ten minutes I was rejoiced to find my friend's arm in mine, and to get away from the scene of uproar. He walked swiftly, and in silence for some few minutes, until we had turned down one of the quiet streets which lead through Edgware Road. You did it very nicely, doctor, he remarked. Nothing could have been better. It is all right. Do you have the photograph? I know where it is. And how did you find out? She showed me, as I told you she would. I'm still in the dark. I do not wish to make a mystery, said he, laughing. The matter was perfectly simple. You, of course, saw that everyone in the street was an accomplice. They were all engaged for the evening. I guessed as much. Then... When the row broke out, I had a little moist red paint in the palm of my hand. I rushed forward, fell down, clapped my hand to my face, and became a piteous spectacle. It's an old trick. That also I could fathom. Then they carried me in. She was bound to have me in. What else could she do? And into her sitting room, which was the very room which I suspected. It lay between that and her bedroom, and I was determined to see which. They laid me on a couch. I motioned for air. They were compelled to open the window, and you had your chance. How did that help you? It was all important. When a woman thinks that her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing that she values most. It is a perfectly overpowering impulse, and I have more than once taken advantage of it. In the case of the Darlington substitution scandal, it was of use to me, 
and also in the Arnsworth Castle business. A married woman grabs at her baby. An unmarried one reaches for her jewel box. Now it is clear to me that our lady of today had nothing in the house more precious to her than what we are in quest of. She would rush to secure it. The alarm of fire was admirably done. The smoke and shouting were enough to shake nerves of steel. She responded beautifully. The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel above the right bell pull. She was there in an instant, and I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I cried that it was a false alarm, she replaced it, glanced at the rocket and rushed from the room, and I have not seen her since. I rose, and making my excuses, escaped from the house. I hesitated whether in an attempt to secure the photograph at once, but the coachman had come in, and as he was watching me narrowly, it seemed safer to wait. A little over precipitance may ruin all. And now, I asked, our quest is practically finished. I shall call with the king tomorrow, and with you if you care to come with us. We shall be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady, but it is probable that when she comes she may find neither us nor the photograph. It might be a satisfaction to his majesty to regain it with his own hands. And when will you call? At eight in the morning. She will not be up, so that we shall have a clear field. Besides, we must be prompt, for this marriage may mean a complete change in her life and habits. I must wire to the king without delay. We had reached Baker Street and stopped at the door. He was searching his pockets for the key when someone passing said, Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. There were several people on the pavement at the time but the greeting appeared to come from a slim youth in an ulster who had hurried by. "'I've heard that voice before,' said Holmes, staring down the dimly lit street. "'Now I wonder who the deuce that could have been.' I slept at Baker Street that night, and we were engaged upon our toast and coffee in the morning when the King of Bohemia rushed into the room. "'You really have got it,' he cried, grasping Sherlock Holmes by either shoulder and looking eagerly into his face. "'Not yet. But you have hopes?' I have hopes. Then come. I am all impatience to be gone. We must have a cab. No, my brougham is waiting. Then that will simplify matters. We descended and started off once more for Briony Lodge. Irene Adler is married, remarked Holmes. Married? When? Yesterday. But to whom? An English lawyer named Norton. But she could not love him? I am in hopes that she does. And why in hopes? Because it would spare your majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love your majesty. If she does not love your majesty, there is no reason why she would interfere with your majesty's plan. It is true, and yet, well, I wish she would have been of my own station. What a queen she would have made. He relapsed into a moody silence, which was not broken until we drew up in Serpentine Avenue. The door of Bryony Lodge was open, and an elderly woman stood upon the steps. She watched us with a sardonic eye as we stepped from the brougham. "'Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe,' said she. "'I am Mr. Holmes,' answered my companion, "'looking at her with a questioning and rather startled gaze. "'Indeed, my mistress told me that you were likely to call. "'She left this morning with her husband by the 5.15 train from Charing Cross for the continent.' "'What?' Sherlock Holmes staggered back, white with chagrin and surprise. "'Do you mean she has left England? Never to return?' "'And the papers?' asked the king hoarsely. "'All is lost. We shall see.' He pushed past the servant and rushed into the drawing-room, followed by the king and myself. The furniture was scattered about in every direction, with dismantled shelves and open drawers as if the lady had hurriedly ransacked them. Holmes rushed at the bell-pull, tore back a small sliding shutter, and plunging in his hand, pulled out a photograph and a letter. The photograph was of Irene Adler herself, in an evening dress.' The letter superscribed to Sherlock Holmes, Esquire, to be left till called for. My friend tore it open, and we all three read it together, dated at midnight of the preceding night, and ran this way. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely, until after the alarm of fire I had not a suspicion, but then... When I found how I had betrayed myself, I began to think I had been warned against you months ago. I had been told that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you, and your address had been given me. Yet, with all this, you made me reveal what you wanted to know, even after I became suspicious. I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind old clergyman, 
you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. Male costume is nothing new to me. I often take advantage of the freedom which it gives. I sent John, the coachman, to watch you. Ran upstairs, got into my walking clothes, as I call them, and came down just as you departed. Well, I followed you to your door, and so made sure that I was really an object of interest to the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then I rather imprudently wished you a good night, and started for the temple to see my husband. We both thought the best resource was flight when pursued by so formidable an antagonist. So you will find the nest empty when you call tomorrow. As to the photograph, your client may rest in peace. I love and am loved by a better man than he. The king may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged. I keep it only to safeguard myself, and to preserve a weapon which will always secure me from any steps which he might take in the future. I leave a photograph which he might care to possess, and I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton. What a woman, oh, what a woman, cried the King of Bohemia, when we had all three read this epistle. Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Is it not a pity that she was not on my level? From what I have seen of the lady, she seems indeed to be on a very different level to yours, Majesty, said Holmes coldly. I'm sorry I've not been able to bring your Majesty's business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir, cried the king, nothing could be more successful. I know that her word is inviolate. The photograph is now as safe as it were if it were in a fire. I'm glad to hear your Majesty say so. I'm immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me in what way I can reward you. This ring? He slipped an emerald snake ring from his finger and held it out upon the palm of his hand. Your Majesty has something which I should value even more highly, said Holmes. You have but to name it. This photograph. The king stared at him in amazement. Irene's photograph? Certainly, if you wish it. I thank your Majesty. Then there is no more to be done in the matter. I have the honour to wish you a very good morning. He bowed, and turning away without observing the hand which the king had stretched out to him, he set off in my company for his chambers. And that was how a great scandal threatened to affect the kingdom of Bohemia, and how the best plans of Mr. Sherlock Holmes were beaten by a woman's wit. He used to make merry over the cleverness of women, but I have not heard him do it of late. And when he speaks of Irene Adler, or when he refers to her photograph, it's always under the honourable title of The Woman. The Red-Headed League I had called upon my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes one day in the autumn of last year, and found him in deep conversation with a very stout, florid-faced elderly gentleman with fiery red hair. With an apology for my intrusion, I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. "'You could not possibly have come at a better time, my dear Watson,' he said cordially. "'I was afraid that you were engaged. So I am. Very much so. Then I can wait in the next room. Not at all. This gentleman, Mr. Wilson, has been my partner and helper in many of my most successful cases, and I have no doubt that he will be of the utmost use to me in yours also. The stout gentleman half rose from his chair and gave a bob of greeting, with a quick little questioning glance from his small, fat, encircled eyes. Try the settee, said Holmes, relapsing into his armchair and putting his fingertips together, as was his custom when in judicial moods. I know, my dear Watson, that you share my love of all that is bizarre and outside the conventions of humdrum routine of everyday life. You have shown your relish for it by the enthusiasm which has prompted you to chronicle and, if you will excuse me saying so, somewhat to embellish so many of my own little adventures. Your cases have indeed been of the greatest interest to me, I observed. You will remember that I remarked the other day, just before we went into the very simple problem presented by Miss Mary Sutherland, that for strange effects and extraordinary combinations we must go to life itself, which is always far more daring than any effort of the imagination. A proposition which I took the liberty of doubting. You did, Doctor, but nonetheless you must come round to my view, for otherwise I shall keep on piling fact upon fact on you until your reason breaks down under them, and acknowledges me to be right. Now, Mr. Jabez Wilson here has been good enough to call upon me this morning, and to begin a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular which I have listened to for some time. 
You have heard me remark that the strangest and most unique things are very often connected not with the larger but with the smaller crimes, and occasionally, indeed, where there is room for doubt whether any positive crime has been committed. As far as I have heard, it is impossible for me to say whether the present case is an instance of crime or not. But the course of events is certainly among the most singular that I have ever listened to. Perhaps, Mr. Wilson, you would have the great kindness to recommence your narrative. I ask you not merely because my friend Dr. Watson has not heard the opening part, but also because the peculiar nature of the story makes me anxious to have every possible detail from your lips. As a rule, when I have heard some slight indication of the course of events, I am able to guide myself by the thousands of other similar cases which occur to my memory. In the present instance, I am forced to admit that the facts are, to the best of my belief, unique. The portly client puffed out his chest with an appearance of some little pride and pulled a dirty and wrinkled newspaper from the inside pocket of his great coat. As he glanced down the advertisement column with his head thrust forward and the paper flattened out upon his knee, I took a good look at the man and endeavoured, after the fashion of my companion, to read the indications which might be presented by his dress or appearance. I did not gain very much, however, by my inspection. Our visitor bore every mark of being an average commonplace British tradesman, obese, pompous, and slow. He wore rather baggy grey shepherd's check trousers, a not over-clean black frock coat unbuttoned in the front, and a drab waistcoat with a heavy brassy Albert chain and a square pierced bit of metal dangling down as an ornament. A frayed top hat and a faded brown overcoat with a wrinkled velvet collar lay upon a chair beside him. Altogether, look as I would, there was nothing remarkable about the man save his blazing red head and the expression of extreme chagrin and discontent upon his features. Sherlock Holmes's quick eye took in my occupation, and he shook his head with a smile as he noticed my questioning glances. Beyond the obvious facts that he has at some time done manual labour, that he takes snuff and is a Freemason, has been to China and has done a considerable amount of writing lately, I can deduce nothing else. Mr. Jabez Wilson started up in his chair with his forefinger upon the paper, but his eyes upon my companion. "'How in the name of good fortune did you know all that, Mr. Holmes?' he asked. "'How did you know, for example, that I did manual labour? It's as true as gospel, for I began as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir, your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. You have worked with it, and the muscles are more developed. The snuff, then, the Freemasonry.' I won't insult your intelligence by telling you how I read that, especially as, rather than against the strict rules of your order, you use an arc and compass breastpin. Ah, oh, of course, I forgot that. But the writing? What else can be indicated by that right cuff so very shiny for five inches and the left one with the smooth patch near the elbow where you rest it upon the desk? Well, but China. The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could have only been done in China. I have made a small study of tattoo marks and have even contributed to the literature of the subject. That trick of staining the fish's scales of a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China, when in addition I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain. The matter becomes even more simple. Mr. Jabez Wilson laughed heavily. Well, I never, said he. I thought at first that you had done something clever, but I see there was nothing in it after all. I begin to think, Watson, said Holmes that I make a mistake in explaining. Omne ignotum pro magnifico, you know, and my poor little reputation, such as it is, will suffer shipwreck if I am so candid. Can you not find the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I have got it now, he answered, with his thick red finger planted halfway down the column. Here it is. This is what began it all. You can just read it for yourself, sir. I took the paper from him and read as follows. To the Red-Headed League. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, USA, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men who are sound in body and mind and above the age of 21 years are eligible. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, Seven Popes Court, Fleet Street. What on earth does this mean? I ejaculated after I had twice read over the extraordinary announcement. Holmes chuckled and wriggled in his chair, as was his habit when in high spirits. It is a little off the beaten track, isn't it? said he. 
And now, Mr. Wilson, off you go at scratch and tell us all about yourself, your household, and the effect which this advertisement had upon your fortunes. You will make first a note, Doctor, of the paper and the date. It is the Morning Chronicle of April 27th, 1890, two months ago. Very good. Now, Mr. Wilson... "'Well, it's just as I've been telling you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes,' said Jabez Wilson, mopping his forehead. "'I have a small pawnbroker's business at Coburg Square near the city. "'It's not a very large affair, and of late years it has not done more than just give me a living. "'I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only keep one. "'And I would have a job to pay him, but that he's willing to come for half a wage, so as to learn the business. "'What's the name of this uh, obliging youth?' asked Sherlock Holmes. His name is Vincent Spaulding, and he's not such a youth either. It's hard to say his age. I should not wish a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. And I know very well that he could better himself and earn twice what I'm able to give him, but after all, if he's satisfied, why should I put ideas in his head? Why, indeed, you seem most fortunate in having an employee who comes under the full market price. It is not a common experience among employers in this age. I don't know that your assistant is not as remarkable as your advertisement. Oh, he has his faults too, said Mr. Wilson. Never was such a fellow for photography, snapping away with a camera when he ought to be improving his mind, and then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. That's his main fault. But on the whole, he's a good worker. There's no vice in him. He's still with you, I presume? Yes, sir. He and a girl of fourteen who does a bit of simple cooking and keeps the place clean. That's all I have in the house, for I'm a widower. Never had any family. We live very quietly, sir, the three of us, and keep a roof over our heads and pay our debts if we do nothing more. The first thing that put us out was that advertisement. Spaulding, he came down into the office just this day eight weeks, with this very paper in his hands, and says, I wish to the Lord, Mr. Wilson, I was a red-headed man. Why is that, I asks. Why, says he, here's another vacancy on the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth quite a little fortune to any man who gets it. I understand there's more vacancies than there are men, so the trustees are at their wits' end what to do with the money. If my hair would only change colour, here's a nice little crib all ready for me to step into. Why, what is it then, I asked, you see, Mr. Holmes? I'm a very stay-at-home man, and as my business came to me instead of me having to go to it, I was often weeks on end without putting my foot over the doormat. In that way I didn't know much of what was going on outside, and I was always glad of a bit of news. "'Have you never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men?' he asked, with his eyes open. "'Never. Why, I wonder at that, for you are eligible yourself for one of these vacancies.' "'What are they worth?' I asked. "'Merely a couple hundred a year, but the work is slight, and it need not interfere very much with one's other occupations.' "'Well, you can easily think that made me prick up my ears, for the business has not been over good for some years, and an extra couple of hundred would be very handy.' "'Tell me about it,' I said. "'Well,' said he, showing me the advertisement, you can see for yourself that the League has a vacancy, and there's the address where you apply for the particulars. As far as I can make out, the League is founded by an American millionaire, Ezekiah Hopkins, who was very peculiar in his ways. He was himself red-headed, and had such a great sympathy for all red-headed men. So when he died, it was found that he had left his enormous fortune in the hands of trustees, with instructions to apply the interest to the providing easy births to men whose hair is of that colour, from all I hear, it's splendid pay and very little to do. But, said I, there'd be millions of red-headed men who would apply. Not as many as you might think, he answered. You see, it's really confined to Londoners and to grown men. This American had started from London when he was young, and he wanted to do the old town a good turn. Then again, I've heard it's no use your applying if your hair is light red or dark red or anything but real bright, blazing, fiery red. Now, if you cared to apply, Mr. Wilson, you could just walk in, but perhaps it would hardly be worth your while to put yourself out of your way, for the sake of a few hundred quid. Now, it is a fact, gentlemen, as you may see for yourselves, that my hair is of a very full and rich tint, so that it may have seemed to me that if there was to be any competition in the matter, I stood as good a chance as any man that I had ever met. Vincent Spaulding seemed to know so much about it that I thought he might prove useful, so I ordered him to put up the shutters for the day and to come right away with me. He was very willing to have a holiday, so we shut the business up and started off for the address that was given in the advertisement. I never hoped to see such a sight as that again, Mr. Holmes. From north, south, east and west, every man who had a shade of red in his hair had tramped into the city to answer the advert. Fleet Street was choked with red-headed folk, and Pope's Court looked like a Costa's orange barrow. I should not have thought that there were so many in the whole country, 
as were brought together by that single ad. Every shade of colour they were, straw, lemon, orange, brick, Irish setter, liver, clay. But as Spalding said, there were not many who had the real vivid flame-coloured tint. When I saw how many were waiting, I would have given it up in despair, but Spalding would not hear of it. How he did it, I could not imagine, but he pushed and pulled and butted in till he got me through the crowd and right up to the steps which led to the office. There was a double stream upon the stair, some going up in hope and some coming back dejected, but we wedged in as well as we could and soon found ourselves in the office. "'Your experience has been a most entertaining one,' remarked Holmes as his client paused and refreshed his memory with a huge pinch of snuff. "'Pray continue with your very interesting statement.' There was nothing in the office but a couple of wooden chairs and a deal table, behind which sat a small man with a head that was even redder than mine. He said a few words to each candidate as he came up, and always managed to find some fault in them which would disqualify them. Getting a vacancy did not seem to be a very easy matter after all, however when our turn came the little man was much more favourable to me than any of the others. He closed the door as we entered so that he might have a private word with us. This is Mr. Jabez Wilson, said my assistant, and he's willing to fill a vacancy in the league. And he's admirably suited for it, the other answered. He has every requirement. I cannot recall when I have seen anything so fine. He took a step backward, cocked his head on one side, and gazed at my hair until I felt quite bashful. Suddenly he plunged forward, wrung my hand, and congratulated me warmly on my success. It would be an injustice to hesitate, said he. You will, however, I'm sure, excuse me for taking an obvious precaution. With that, he seized my hair in both his hands and tugged until I yelled with the pain. There is water in your eyes, said he as he released me. I perceive that all is as it should be. We have to be careful, for we've twice been deceived by wigs and once by paint. I could tell you tales of cobbler's wax which would disgust you with human nature. He stepped over to a window and shouted through it at the top of his voice that the vacancy was filled. A groan of disappointment came up from below, and the folk all trooped away in different directions, until there was not a red head to be seen, except my own, and that of the manager. "'My name,' said he, "'is Mr. Duncan Ross, and I am myself one of the pensioners upon the fund left by our noble benefactor. Are you a married man, Mr. Wilson? Have you family?' I answered that I had not. His face fell immediately. "'Dear me,' he said gravely, "'that's very serious indeed.' I'm sorry to hear you say that. The fund was of course for the propagation and spread of the redheads as well for their maintenance. It's exceedingly unfortunate that you should be a bachelor. My face lengthened at this, Mr. Holmes, for I thought that I was not to have the vacancy after all. But after thinking it over for a few minutes, he said it was all right. In the case of another, said he, the objection might be fatal, but we must stretch a point in favour of a man with such a head of hair as yours. When shall you be able to enter upon your new duties?' "'Well, it's a little awkward, for I have a business already,' said I. "'Never mind about that, Mr. Wilson,' said Vincent Spaulding. "'I should be able to look after that for you.' "'What would that be for the hours?' I asked. Ten to two. "'Now, a pawnbroker's business is mostly done of evening, Mr. Holmes, "'especially Thursday and Friday evening, which is just before payday. "'So it would suit me very well to earn a little in the morning. "'Besides, I knew my assistant was a good man, "'and he would see to anything that turned up. "'That would suit me very well,' said I. "'And the pay?' four pounds a week. And the work? Purely nominal. What do you call purely nominal? Well, you have to be in the office, or at least in the building the whole time. If you leave, you forfeit your whole position forever. The will is very clear upon that point. You don't comply with the conditions if you budge from the office during that time. It's only four hours a day, and I should not think of leaving, said I. No excuse will avail, said Mr. Duncan Ross. Neither sickness, nor business, nor anything else. There you must stay." or you will lose your billet. And the work? Copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's the first volume of it in the press. Find your own ink, pens, and blotting paper, but we provide the table and chair. Will you be ready tomorrow? Certainly, I answered. Then goodbye, Mr. Jabez Wilson, and let me congratulate you once more on the important position which you have been fortunate enough to gain. He bowed me out of the room, and I went home with my assistant, hardly knowing what to say or do, as I was so pleased at my own good fortune. Well, I thought over the matter all day, and by evening I was in low spirits again, for I had quite persuaded myself that the whole affair must be a great hoax or a fraud, though what its object might be I could not imagine. It seemed altogether past belief that anyone could make such a will. 
that they would pay such a sum for doing anything as simple as copying out Encyclopedia Britannica. Vincent Spaulding did what he could to cheer me up, but by bedtime I had reasoned myself out of the whole thing. However, in the morning I determined to have a look at it anyhow, so I bought a penny bottle of ink, and with a quill pen and seven sheets of full scrap paper, I started off for Pope's Court. To my surprise and delight, everything was as right as possible. The table was set out ready for me, Mr. Duncan Ross was there to see that I got fairly to work. He started me off upon the letter A, and left me, but he would drop in from time to time and see that all was right with me. At two o'clock he bade me good day, complimented me upon the amount that I had written, and locked the door of the office after me. This went on day after day, Mr. Holmes, and on Saturday the manager came in and planked down four golden sovereigns for my week's work. It was the same next week, and the same the week after. Every morning I was there at ten, every afternoon I left at two. By degrees Mr. Duncan Ross took to coming in only once of a morning, and then after a time he did not come in at all. Still, of course, I never dared to leave the room for an instant. I was not sure when he might come, and the billet was such a good one and suited me so well that I would not risk the loss of it. Eight weeks passed away like this, and I had written about abbots and archery and armour and architecture and attica, hoped with diligence that I might get onto the bees before very long. It cost me something in foolscap, and I had pretty nearly filled a shelf with my writings. Suddenly the whole business came to an end. To an end... Yes, sir, and no later than this morning I went to work as usual at ten o'clock, but the door was shut and locked, and a little square of cardboard was hammered on to the middle of the panel with a tack. Here it is, and you can read it for yourself. He held up a piece of white cardboard about the size of a sheet of note paper. It read in this fashion. The Red-Headed League is dissolved. October 9th, 1890. Sherlock Holmes and I surveyed this curt announcement and the rueful face behind it till the comical side of the affair so completely overtopped every other consideration that we both burst out into a roar of laughter. "'Well, I cannot see that there is anything very funny,' cried our client, flushing up to the roots of his flaming head. "'If you can do nothing better than laugh at me, I can go elsewhere.' "'No, no,' cried Holmes, shoving him back into the chair from which he had half risen. "'I really would admit your case for the world. It's most refreshingly unusual. But there is, if you will excuse my saying so, Something just a little funny about it. Pray, what steps did you take when you found the card upon the door? I was staggered, sir. I did not know what to do, and I called the offices round, but none of them seemed to know anything about it. Finally, I went to the landlord, who's an accountant living on the ground floor, and I asked him if he could tell me what had become of the Red-Headed League. He said he had never heard of any such body. I asked him who Mr. Duncan Ross was, and he answered that the name was new to him. Well, I said, it's the gentleman at number four. The red-headed man? Yeah. Oh, his name was William Morris, a solicitor using my room as a temporary convenience until his new premises were ready. He moved out yesterday. Where can I find him? At his new offices. He told me the address, yes. 17 King Edward Street, near St. Paul's. I started off, Mr. Holmes, but when I got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. No one in it had ever heard of Mr. William Morris or Mr. Duncan Ross. "'And what did you do then?' asked Holmes. "'I went home to Saxeburg Square. "'I took the advice of my assistant, but he could not help me in any way. "'He could only say if I waited I should hear by post, "'but that was not good enough, Mr. Holmes. "'I did not wish to lose such a place without a struggle. "'As I had heard that you were good enough to give advice to poor folk "'who were in need of it, I came right away to you.' "'And you did very wisely,' said Holmes. "'Your case is an exceedingly remarkable one. "'I shall be happy to look into it. From what you've told me, I think it's possible the graver issues hang from it than might at first sight appear. Grave enough, said Mr. Jabez Wilson. Why have I lost four pound a week? As far as you are personally concerned, remarked Holmes, I do not see that you have any grievance against this extraordinary league. On the contrary, you are, as I understand, richer by some thirty pounds, to say nothing of the minute knowledge which you've gained on every subject which comes under the letter A. You have lost nothing by them. No, sir, but I want to find out about them, who they are, what the object of playing this prank was, if it was a prank, upon me. It was a pretty expensive joke for them, for it cost them two and thirty pounds. We shall endeavour to clear up these points for you. And first, one or two questions, Mr. Wilson. This assistant of yours who first called your attention to the advertisement, how long has he been with you? Ah, uh, about a month, then. 
How did he come? In answer to an ad? Was he the only applicant? No, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Because he was handy and he would come cheap. Half wages, in fact. Yes. What's he like, Vincent Spalding? Small, stout built, quick in his ways, no hair on his face. He's not short of thirty, a white splash of acid upon his forehead. Holmes sat up in his chair in considerable excitement. I thought as much, said he. Have you ever observed that his ears are pierced for earrings? Yes, sir, he told me that a gypsy had done it for him when he was a lad. Hmm, said Holmes, sinking back in deep thought. He's still with you? Oh, yes, sir, I have only just him left. And has your business been attended to in your absence? Nothing to complain of, sir. There's never very much to do of a morning. That'll do, Mr. Wilson. I shall be happy to give you an opinion upon the subject in the course of a day or two. Today is Saturday, and I hope that by Monday we may come to a conclusion. Well, Watson, said Holmes when our visitor had left us, what do you make of it all? I make nothing of it, I answered frankly. It is a most mysterious business. As a rule, said Holmes, the more bizarre a thing is, the less mysterious it proves to be. It is your commonplace featureless crimes which are really puzzling. Just as a commonplace face is the most difficult to identify, but I must be prompt over this matter. What are you going to do then, I asked. To smoke, he answered. It is quite a three-pipe problem, and I beg that you won't speak to me for fifty minutes. He curled himself up in his chair with his thin knees drawn up to his hawk-like nose. There he sat with his eyes closed and his black clay pipe thrusting out like the bill of a strange bird. I had come to the conclusion that he had dropped asleep and indeed was nodding myself, when he suddenly sprang out of his chair with the gesture of a man who has made up his mind and put his pipe down upon the mantelpiece. Saracet plays at the St. James Hall in the afternoon, he remarked. What do you think, Watson? Could your patience spare you for a few hours? I have nothing to do today. My practice is never very absorbing. Then put on your hat and come. I'm going through the city first, and we can have some lunch on the way. I observe that there is a good deal of German music on the program, which is more to my taste than Italian or French. It is introspective, and I want to introspect. Come along. We travelled by the underground as far as Aldersgate, and a short walk took us to Saxeburg Square, the scene of the singular story which we had listened to in the morning. It was a pokey little shabby genteel place where four lines of dingy two-story brick houses looked out into a small railed-in enclosure, where a lawn of weedy grass and a few clumps of faded laurel bushes made a hard fight against a smoke-laden and uncongenial atmosphere. Three gilt balls and a brown board with Jabez Wilson in white letters upon a corner house announced the place where our red-headed client carried on his business. Sherlock Holmes stopped in front of it with his head on one side and looked it all over, his eyes shining brightly between puckered lids. He walked slowly up the street and down again to the corner, looking keenly at the houses. Finally, he returned to the pawnbroker's and having thumped vigorously upon the pavement with his stick two or three times, went up to the door and knocked. It was instantly opened by a bright-looking, clean-shaven young fellow, who asked him to step in. "'Thank you,' said Holmes. "'I only wish to ask how you would go from here to the Strand.' "'A uh, third right, fourth left,' answered the assistant promptly, closing the door. "'Smart fellow, that,' observed Holmes as we walked away. "'He is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest man in London.' and for daring I am not sure that he has not a claim to be third. I have known something of him before. Evidently, said I, Mr. Wilson's assistant counts for a good deal in this mystery of the Red-Headed League. I'm sure you inquired your way merely in order that you might see him. Not him. What then? The knees of his trousers. And what did you see? What I expected to see. Why did you beat the pavement? My dear doctor, this is a time for observation." not for talk. We are spies in an enemy's country. We know something of Saxeburg Square. Let us now explore the parts which lie behind it. The road in which we found ourselves as we turned round the corner from the retired Saxeburg Square presented as great a contrast to it as the front of a picture does to the back. It was one of the main arteries which conveyed the traffic of the city to the north and the west. The roadway was blocked with the immense stream of commerce flowing in a double tide inward and outward, while the footpaths were black with the hurrying swarm of pedestrians. 
It was difficult to realize as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business premises that they really abutted onto the other side upon the faded and stagnant square which we had just quitted. Let me see, said Holmes, standing at the corner and glancing along the line. I should just like to remember the order of the houses here. It's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. There is Mortimer's, the tobacconist, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the city and suburban bank, the vegetarian restaurant, McFarlane's carriage building depot that carries us right on to the other block, and now, Doctor, we've done our work. So it's time we had some play, a sandwich and a cup of coffee, off to violin land where all this sweetness and delicacy and harmony. There is no red-headed clients to vex us with their conundrums. My friend was an enthusiastic musician, being himself not only a very capable performer, but a composer of no ordinary merit. All the afternoon he sat in the stalls, wrapped in the most perfect happiness, gently waving his long fingers in time with the music, while his gently smiling face and languid, dreamy eyes were as unlike those of Holmes the sleuth-hound, Holmes the relentless, keen-witted, ready-handed criminal agent, as it was possible to conceive. In his singular character, the dual nature and contemplative mood which occasionally predominated in him, the swing of his nature took him from extreme languor to devouring energy, and, as I know well, he was never so truly formidable as when, for days on end, he had been lounging in his armchair amid his improvisations and his black-letter editions. Then it was that the lust of the chase would suddenly come upon him. His brilliant reasoning power would rise to a level of intuition, until those who were unacquainted with his methods would look askance to him as a man whose knowledge was not that of other mortals. When I saw him that afternoon so enwrapped in the music of St. James's Hall, I felt that an evil time might be coming upon those whom he had set himself to hunt down. "'You want to go home, no doubt, Doctor,' he remarked as we emerged. "'Yes, it would be as well. I have some business to do which will take some hours. This business at Coburg Square is serious. Why serious?' A considerable crime is in contemplation. I have every reason to believe that we shall be in time to stop it. But today being Saturday rather complicates matters. I shall want your help tonight. At what time? Ten will be early enough. I'll be at Baker Street at ten. Very well. And I say, Doctor, there may be some little danger, so kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. He waved his hand, turned on his heel, and disappeared in an instant among the crowd. I trust that I'm not more dense than my neighbours, but... I was always oppressed with a sense of my own stupidity in my dealings with Sherlock Holmes. Here I had heard what he had heard. I had seen what he had seen. And yet, from his words, it was evident that he saw clearly not only what had happened, but what was about to happen. While to me the whole business was confused and grotesque. As I drove home to my house in Kensington, I thought over it all from the extraordinary story of the red-headed copier of the encyclopedia down to the visit to Saxeburg Square, and the ominous words with which he had parted from me. What was this nocturnal expedition, and why should I go armed? Where were we going? What were we going to do? I had a hint from Holmes that this smooth-faced pawnbroker's assistant was a formidable man, a man who might play a deep game. I tried to puzzle it out, but gave it up in despair and set the matter aside until night should bring an explanation. It was a quarter past nine when I started from home and made my way across the park, and so through Oxford Street to Baker Street, two hansoms were standing at the door. As I entered the passage, I heard the sound of voices from above. On entering his room, I found Holmes in animated conversation with two men, one of whom I recognized as Peter Jones, the official police agent, while the other was a long, thin, sad-faced man with a very shiny hat and an impressively respectable frock coat. Ha! Our party is complete, said Holmes, buttoning up his pea jacket and taking his heavy hunting crop from the rack. Watson, I think you know Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard. Let me introduce you to Mr. Merriweather, who is to be our companion in tonight's adventure. We're hunting in couples again, Doctor, you see, said Jones in his consequential way. Our friend here is a wonderful man for starting a chase. All he wants is an old dog to help him do the running down. I hope a wild goose may not prove to be the end of our chase, observed Mr. Merriweather gloomily. You may place considerable confidence in Mr. Holmes, sir, said the police agent loftily. He has his own little methods, which are, if you won't mind me saying so, a little too theoretical and fantastic, but he has the markings of a detective in him. 
It's not too much to say that once or twice, as in that business of the Sholto murder and the Agra treasure, he's been more nearly correct than the official force. Oh, if you say so, Mr. Jones, it is all right, said the stranger with deference. Still, I confess I miss my rubber. It's my first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I've not had my rubber. I think you will find, said Sherlock Holmes, that you will play for a higher stake tonight than you have ever done yet, and that the play will be more exciting. For you, Mr. Merriweather, the stake will be some thirty thousand pounds, and for you, Jones, it will be the man upon whom you wish to lay your hands. John Clay. Murderer, thief, smasher, forger, a young man, Mr. Merriweather, but he's at the head of his profession, and I would rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. A remarkable man he is, young John Clay. His grandfather, a royal duke. He himself has been to Eton and Oxford. His brain is as cunning as his fingers. And though we might meet signs of him at every turn, we never know where to find the man himself. He'll crack a crib in Scotland one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. I've been on his track for years, and I've never set eyes on him yet. Well, I hope I have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. I've had one or two little turns also with Mr. John Clay, and I agree with you that he is the head of his profession. It is past ten, however, and quite time we started. If you two will take the first hansom, Watson and I will follow in the second. Sherlock Holmes was not very communicative during the long drive, and lay back in the cab humming the tunes which he had heard in the afternoon. We rattled through an endless labyrinth of gaslit streets until we emerged into Farrington Street. We're close there now, my friend remarked. This fellow Merriweather is a bank director and personally interested in the matter. I thought it as well to have Jones with us also. He's not a bad fellow, though an absolute imbecile in his profession. He has one positive virtue. He is as brave as a bulldog and tenacious as a lobster if he gets his claws upon anyone. Here we are. They're waiting for us. We had reached the same crowded thoroughfare in which we had found ourselves in the morning. Our cabs were dismissed, and following the guidance of Mr. Merriweather, we passed down a narrow passage, through a side door which he opened for us. Within there was a small corridor which ended in a very massive iron gate. This also was opened, and led down a flight of winding stone steps, which terminated at another formidable gate. Mr. Merriweather stopped to light a lantern, and conducted us down a dark, earth-smelling passage. And so, after opening a third door into a huge vault or cellar, which was piled all around the crates and massive boxes, we were not very vulnerable from above, Holmes remarked as he held up the lantern and gazed about him. Nor from below, said Mr. Merriweather, striking his stick upon the flags which lined the floor. Why, dear me, it sounds quite hollow, he remarked, looking up in surprise. I must really ask you to be a little more quiet, said Holmes severely. You've already imperiled the whole success of our expedition. Might I beg that you would have the goodness to sit down upon one of those boxes and not to interfere? The solemn Mr. Merriweather perched himself upon a crate, with a very injured expression upon his face, while Holmes fell upon his knees upon the floor and with the lantern and a magnifying lens began to examine minutely the cracks between the stones. A few seconds sufficed to satisfy him, and he sprang to his feet again and put his glass in his pocket. We have at least an hour before us, he remarked for they can hardly take any steps until the good pawnbroker is safely in bed. Then they will not lose a minute, for the sooner they do their work, the longer time they will have for their escape. We are at present, Doctor, as no doubt you have divined, in the cellar of the city branch of one of the principal London banks. Mr. Merriweather is the chairman of directors, and he will explain to you that there are reasons why the more daring criminals of London should take a considerable interest in this cellar at present. It's our French gold, whispered the director. We had several warnings an attempt might be made upon it. Your French gold? Yes. We had occasion some months ago to strengthen our resources and borrowed for that purpose 30,000 Napoleons from the Bank of France. It's become known that we have never had an occasion to unpack the money, and it's still lying in our cellar. The crate which I sit upon contains 2,000 Napoleons packed between layers of lead foil. Our reserve of bullion is much larger at present than is usually kept in a single branch office and the directors have had misgivings upon the subject. "'Which were very well justified,' observed Holmes. "'And now it is time we arranged our little plans. I expect within an hour matters will come to a head. In the meantime, Mr. Merriweather, we must put our screens over the dark lantern. And sit in the dark? I'm afraid so. I had brought a pack of cards in my pocket, and I thought that, uh, as we were a party, you might have your rubber after all. 
but I see that the enemy's preparations have gone so far we cannot risk the presence of a light. First of all, we must choose our positions. These are daring men, and though we shall take them at a disadvantage, they may do us some harm unless we're careful. I shall stand behind this crate, and do you conceal yourselves behind those? Then when I flash a light upon them, close in swiftly if they fire, Watson, have no compunction about shooting them down. I placed my revolver cocked upon the top of the wooden case behind which I crouched. Holmes shot the slide across the front of his lantern and left us in pitch darkness, such an absolute darkness as I have never experienced. The smell of hot metal remained to assure us that the light was still there, ready to flash out at a moment's notice. To me, my nerves worked up in a pitch of expectancy. There was something depressing and subduing in the sudden gloom and in the cold, dank air of the vault. They have but one retreat, whispered Holmes, at his back through the house into Saxeburg Square. I hope you have done what I asked you, Jones. I have an inspector and two officers waiting at the front door. Then we have stopped all the holes, and now we must be silent and wait. What a time it seemed from comparing notes afterwards. It was but an hour and a quarter. Yet it appeared to me that the night must have almost gone and the dawn be breaking above us. My limbs were weary and stiff. I feared to change my position, yet my nerves were worked up to the highest pitch of tension. My hearing was so acute I could not only hear the gentle breathing of my companions, but I could distinguish the deeper, heavier in-breath of the bulky Jones from the thin, sighing note of the bank director. From my position I could look over the case in the direction of the floor. Suddenly my eyes caught the glint of a light. At first it was but a lurid spark upon the stone pavement. It lengthened out until it became a yellow line, and then, without any warning or sound, a gash seemed to open, a hand appeared, a white, almost womanly hand, which felt about in the centre of the little area of light. For a minute or more, the hand, with its writhing fingers, protruded out of the floor. Then it was withdrawn, as suddenly as it appeared, and all was dark again, save the single lurid spark which marked a chink between the stones. Its disappearance, however, was but momentary, with a rending, tearing sound, one of the broad white stones turned over upon its side, and left a square, gaping hole, through which streamed the light of a lantern. Over the edge there peeped a clean-cut, boyish face, which looked keenly about it. With a hand on either side of the aperture drew itself shoulder-high and waist-high, until one knee rested upon the edge. In another instant he stood at the side of the hole, and was hauling after him a companion, lithe and small like himself, with a pale face and a shock of very red hair. "'It's all clear,' he whispered. "'Have you the chisel and the bags?' "'Great, Scott! Jump, Archie, jump! I'll swing for it!' Sherlock Holmes had sprung out and seized the intruder by the collar. The other dived down the hole, and I heard the sound of rending cloth as Jones clutched at his skirts. The light flashed upon the barrel of a revolver, but Holmes' hunting crop came down upon the man's wrist— and the pistol clinked upon the stone floor. "'It's no use, John Clay,' said Holmes blandly. "'You have no chance at all.' "'So I see,' the other answered with the utmost coolness. "'I fancy my pal's all right. "'I see you've got his coattails.' "'There are three men waiting for him at the door,' said Holmes. "'Oh, indeed. "'You seem to have done the thing very completely. "'I must compliment you.' "'And I you,' Holmes answered. "'Your red-headed idea was very new and effective.' "'You'll see your pal again presently,' said Jones. "'He's quicker at climbing down holes than I am. "'Just hold out while I fix the derbies.' "'I beg that you will not touch me with your filthy hands,' "'remarked our prisoner as the handcuffs clattered upon his wrists. "'You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. "'Have the goodness also when you address me always to say, "'Sir, and please.' "'All right,' said Jones with a stare and a snigger. "'Would you please, sir, march upstairs "'where we can get a cab to carry your highness to the police station?' "'That's better,' said John Clay serenely. He made a sweeping bow to the three of us and walked quietly off in the custody of the detective. "'Really, Mr. Holmes,' said Mr. Merriweather as we followed them from the cellar, "'I do not know how the bank can thank you or repay you. There is no doubt you have detected and defeated in the most complete manner one of the most determined attempts at a bank robbery that I have ever come within my experience. I have had one or two little scores on my own to settle with Mr. John Clay,' said Holmes." I have been at uh, some small expense over this matter, which I shall expect the bank to refund, but beyond that I am amply repaid by having had an experience which in many ways unique, and by hearing the very remarkable narrative of the Red-Headed League. 
You see, Watson, he explained in the early hours of the morning as we sat over a glass of whiskey and soda in Baker Street, it was perfectly obvious from the first that the only possible object of this rather fantastic business of the advertisement of the League and the copying of the Encyclopedica must be to get this not over-bright pawnbroker out of the way for a number of hours every day. It was a curious way of managing it, but really it would be difficult to suggest a better one. The method was no doubt suggested to Clay's ingenious mind by the colour of his accomplice's hair. The four pound a week was a lure which must draw him, and what was it to them who were playing for thousands? They put in the advert that one rogue has a temporary office, the other rogue incites the man to apply for it. Together they managed to secure his absence every morning in the week. From the time that I had heard of the assistant having come for half wages, it was obvious to me he had some strong motive for securing the situation. But how could you guess what the motive was? Had there been a woman in the house, I should have suspected a mere vulgar intrigue. That, however, was out of the question. The man's business was a small one, and there was nothing in his house which could account for such elaborate preparations and such an expenditure as they were at. It must then be something out of the house. What could it be, I thought, of the assistant's fondness for photography, his trick of vanishing into the cellar? The cellar. There was the end of the tangled clue. Then I made inquiries as to this mysterious assistant and found I had to deal with one of the coolest and most daring criminals in London. He was doing something in the cellar, something which took many hours a day for months on end. What could it be once more? I could think of nothing save that he was running a tunnel to some other building. So far I had got when we went to visit the scene of the action, I surprised you by beating upon the pavement with my stick. I was ascertaining whether the cellar stretched out in front or behind. It was not in front. I rang the bell, and as I hoped, the assistant answered it. We've had some skirmishes, but never set eyes upon each other before. I hardly looked at his face. His knees were what I wished to see. You must yourself have remarked how worn, wrinkled, and stained they were. They spoke of those hours of burrowing. The only remaining point was what they were burrowing for. I walked round the corner, saw the city and suburban bank abutted on our friend's premises, and felt I had solved my problem. When you drove home after the concert, I called upon Scotland Yard and upon the chairman of the bank directors, with the result that you have seen. And how could you tell that they would make their attempt tonight? I asked. Well, when they closed their league offices, that was a sign that they cared no longer about Mr. Jabez Wilson's presence. In other words, they had completed their tunnel. But it was essential that they should use it soon, as it might be discovered, or the bullion might be removed. Saturday would suit them better than any other day, as it would give them two days for their escape, for all the reasons that I expected them to come tonight. You reasoned it out beautifully, I exclaimed in unfeigned admiration. It's so long a chain, and yet every link rings true. It saved me from ennui, he answered, yawning. Alas, I already feel it closing in upon me. My life is spent in one long effort to escape from the commonplace of existence. These little problems help me to do so. And you are a benefactor of the race, said I. He shrugged his shoulders. Well, perhaps. After all, it is of some little use, he remarked. L'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout, as Gustave Flaubert wrote to George Sand. And that is where we shall close the book on a bumper bonus episode of Down to Sleep.